she can't get married at Clytemnestra won't let her because if she gets married, maybe that guy will claim to be king because at least he's married to the daughter of the rightful king. And so she's just had this nothing life and wants it to end, wants it to get back to normal. And so they kind of get in cahoots, start trying to put together a plan about how they're going to get rid, and by that I mean kill, Clytemnestra. You're listening to Classical Etc., a show from the Memoria Press Podcast Network, where we offer an in-depth look at the philosophy, culture, and heart of the Memoria Press family. Now, here's your host, Shane Saxon. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Memoria Press Podcast. Today, I got a chance to sit down with John Christensen, a classical teacher for Memoria Press Online Academy, as well as the Latin specialist at Memoria Press. And John has a wealth of knowledge about everything to do with the Greco-Roman world. Um, and his passion for teaching classical studies is overwhelming. <laughs> Today, we got to talk about specifically the Greek tragedians. These were a number of playwrights who wrote tragedies, and we talked about just the power of this ancient form. Uh, John really got me inspired. I, I want to go back and read these again. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. I need to, I do this every time I'm filming, is I have this annoying habit of just sort of you know, like messing with my hair, and eventually it's just Einsteinian. So, John, uh, I've been looking forward to our conversation because uh, when you meet people, it's very normal that a little bit about them comes out. Um, so, you know, when you meet me, you'll probably learn that I have a dog, that I like the like the Milwaukee Bucks, they play basketball. All right. um, one of the first things I learned about you is that you love the Greek tragedians. Yeah. And I thought that was that was unique. Um so I've been looking forward to this conversation. Would you orient us to the Greek tragedians? Who were they? What's the time period? Give me a few of their names. Yeah, sure. Uh, the Greek tragic period is really delightfully well unified with what we call the Athenian Golden Age. Essentially, there's this century-long period between the Persian War right at the end of the uh, 5th century, or sorry, 6th century BC, leading into the 5th century BC, and all the way to the end of that century, almost exactly 100 years of almost all Greek output or all important Greek output that we know. It's really pretty fascinating. Literary output or? Literary output, architectural output, essentially everything that people think of when they think huh. of what makes Greek stuff Greek sure. is from that century, with the exception of folks like Alexander the Great, who of course was Macedonian and it was, it was, a, it was a different cultural, cultural movement. So the, when we're talking about the tragedians, we're talking about a very long period of development, but a very small century long period of excellence. And it's from that century that we, and everyone prior to us talks about the, the greats, the Greek tragedy that has survived to us and was worth surviving to us. Um, the big three, and this is not simply the ones we select to talk about. These are simply the biggest three, the most famous three by an enormous margin are Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Typically speaking, I mean, they were all contemporaries. They all lived at the same time. Hmm. They all knew each other. Oh, wow. uh, they were rivals because theater was not just a performative Liter literature. It was a competitive literature. Uh, it's kind of like the the French salon, right? In in uh, in painting, it, where in order to become famous, in order to become shown, you have to win. You actually have to win a competition. You have to meet the needs of the tastemakers. And so, uh, these three individuals over that century long period kind of fell in and then fell out of favor of those. Uh, of uh, the people of Athens. Yeah. So Aeschylus was the first big one. Uh, then after him, uh, a decent time after his heyday, but while he was still alive, Sophocles took took the world by storm and Sophocles and Euripides then became sort of chief rivals with each other. And you really only hear about the tragedians, I feel like, but were there comic playwrights in Greece or other genres? What, what did it look like in relation to other playwrights? Absolutely. Now, they had comedy, and they had another third genre you don't hear as much about. So obviously you hear tragedy and comedy as kind of the two poles of theater in general, not just ancient, but nowadays. But they also had this third genre that we call satire plays or satire plays. Uh, 
when we hear it, of course, we think satire, right? This sort of cynical or um, lampooning uh, kind of comedy. But to them, it literally came from the word satyr, like the mythological creature, right? Because these stories were often pastoral, took place in the woods, involved mythological creatures doing strange annoying or buffoonish things. And we right? have plays that have survived to us that were in that genre? A couple. Okay. They were, by their very nature, sort of intermediate. They were intermissions almost between the comedy and the tragedy. So typically speaking, if I'm getting my order right, during a performance, you'd have one of everything. It wouldn't just be, hey, let's go see a tragedy. You'd start with a comedy and the whole family, the entire Greek population would come. And then you'd have the satyr play, which would be, again, comedy, but not as... Um, not as family friendly. And so it was sort of a signal, okay, ladies, time to go. Okay, kids, time to go. And so only the citizens, only the men of the city would remain for the meat, the big stuff, right? The tragedy, which was not only the heavy storytelling, but it was also considered the loftiest storytelling. It was the stories most worth telling, most appropriate for citizens and people running the state to not just enjoy and listen to, but to shape their ideas about what constitutes, say, morality or good citizenship. Yeah. And so what is it about the tragedies that you like? Or is it is it just that these are great plays? I mean, is there what, what grabs your interest about them? Great question. So they are, and this is both me and the ancient world speaking, they are better than comedy. They are better than tragedy. We have comedians, right? We have Aristophanes, for example, uh, who was living a little bit after these guys. He was living in the latter part of the Golden Age and after the Golden Age, after uh, uh, Athens had fallen in the Peloponnesian War. But Aristophanes famously was more of a social critic than an artist, right? Comedy was a platform for for critiquing the state. It was not a, a very... It was not celebrated for its own sake, right? For the art's own sake. Uh, whereas tragedy was a very, very specifically organized art form. And that organization kind of proceeded out of what it had been prior to it being a piece of entertainment or a piece of literature at all. And so it's because of that formula, which doesn't sound like a terribly romantic basis to talk about literature, but it's because of that formula that literary critics or observers of the literature at the time were able to point at not just tragedy, but any given tragedy and speak of it as excellent on an objective level, mm -hmm. right? It's it, when you go watch a movie, who knows what your standards are? Who knows what the basis is for you saying, I liked it, I didn't like it. But tragedies were so reliable in their shape and in the specific function of plot and the specific function of the story that they were supposed to accomplish, that you can point to one as doing something exceptional or unusual, or doing something that's not necessarily exceptional in quality, but exceptional in quantity, right? Okay. Extending something to an egregious degree. Uh, you can point to these pieces of literature as sort of these ideals that are measurable. It's almost a scientific version of literature. It's kind of really the basis of what we talk about when we talk about classics. Um, what When we sit, call classical literature classical literature, what we're referring to is the classis in Latin. It's essentially the ideal model, the basis of a thing. And so a thing is made what it is. A thing is made excellent by participating in that classis, in that class, you know, what we would call it. But then that class is made better with every iteration, right? Because, for example... Um, Aeschylus sets up this paradigm, right? Aeschylus was the first one to turn tragedy into what we want it to be and what the Greeks wanted it to be. And that ended up being elevated when Sophocles got to it. And so, so he, Becca, what, oh, yeah, sure. When you say Aeschylus made it what we wanted it to be, I mean, what is that? Oh, yeah, no, I should probably specify. Um, prior to Aeschylus, tra tragedy existed and it was beginning to become competitive in nature. Again, having that, it was a it was an actual theater competition in Athens. Um, prior to that, it had been a Theban tradition. Theater grew up in Thebes as a religious ritual. It was not for entertainment purposes at all. It was a ritual to Dionysus, uh, the god of wine, the god of uh, dark impulse, right? And uh, over time, as these rituals got more rowdy and more rowdy and more rowdy, the city, the people responsible for the city and therefore responsible for the rituals conducted in the city, decided we're going to tone it 
tone it down, right? Pump the brakes a bit and make sure that these sacrifices of one RAM and then 10 RAMs and then even more and more and more were, would not go out of control because of the distinct emotional nature of the tale, right? This building up of leading towards the sacrifice, leading towards the sacrifice, leading towards the sacrifice, and then the sacrifice, right? And that format is what tragedy became in a narrative way. So we're no longer killing goats when we're reading Aeschylus, right? But we do have a story that's built on the same format, right? Where you have this building of tension, building of tension, building of tension. We know what's going to happen. There are no spoilers in Greek mythology. This is their religion. They know exactly what's going to happen. And then it happens. And so that building tension releases with what we call catharsis. That's the model that Aeschylus perfected. Essentially, what was still kind of nascently becoming a narrative art form following a certain pattern was solidified by the plays of Aeschylus immediately after the Persian War. So give me an example of an Aeschylus play and how it did that. I mean, I'm not terribly familiar with the plays. So what's one that, uh, from Aeschylus that you like? And, and walk me through how he did that in that play. Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm going to use actually the middle of the three uh, plays by, uh, by Aeschylus in the Oresteia. The Oresteia is a trilogy. Um, one of the few deliberate trilogies in Greek uh, in Greek tragedy, where he was actually trying to make a three-part tale. Uh, this story takes place well after the death of a character named Agamemnon. For those who are familiar with the Trojan War, with uh, the Iliad, you know Agamemnon was the king of the king of Argos, who had led all the Greeks off to Troy to take over the city, and they did. Huzzah! This play takes place quite a long time after that, where Agamemnon has returned home in the previous play, in the first play of the trilogy, he has been killed by his, uh, by his wife because his wife is really mad at him for having left and for some other things. And in order to ensure that she remained unpunished for having killed her own husband, she sent her son away because her son was a very young child at the time, couldn't possibly do anything about her having killed his father and her husband. Uh, and so, hey, if he's out of town, if he's out of the city, out of the state, uh, it's going to be way too dangerous for him to come back and I can maintain my own rule and the rule of my kind of illegitimate lover, uh, Aegisthus. Um, and no one's going to avenge the rightful king Agamemnon's death. So this play is largely from the perspective of Orestes after he comes of age. He knows who his father is. And this is the son of Agamemnon. Yes. Son of Clytemnestra. Exactly. So he comes home secretly, because he can't do it unsecretly. And he's grown up, he's aware of what has happened, and he wants to avenge his father. But as he begins making inroads back in town, again, secretly, he meets up with his sister. And his sister, Electra, um, also is very unhappy with her mother, because not only has her mother killed her father, but because she wasn't sent out of town, she has been kind of under a sort of imprisonment, right? She can't get married at Clytemnestra won't let her because if she gets married, maybe that guy will claim to be king because at least he's married to the daughter of the rightful king. And so she's just had this nothing life and wants it to end, wants it to get back to normal. And so they kind of get in cahoots, start trying to put together a plan about how they're going to get rid, and by that I mean kill, Clytemnestra. But then the tension starts building because it's not just a murder plot. It's not just an assassination attempt. We start getting some clues that something grander and so something more supernatural is at play. Uh, the key is that Clytemnestra, who we get to hear from in the story, explains that she believes herself to be guiltless, but not in the literal sense of, you know, having killed her husband. She obviously did that. But she thinks that she has avoided what the Greeks would have immediately recognized is called the curse of the house of Atreus. She is not a member of that family. She's married in, right? Sure. But her husband is what we call an Atreid, a member of the house of Atreus. And they have a generations long curse on their family. Basically that every male family member would be killed violently by another family member's hand right? And that's how it had been for generations at that point. Uh, Agamemnon's father had died by a family member's hand, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, right? And so it seemed to everybody that while Agamemnon dying was a horrible crime, it was kind of the natural conclusion of this curse. And he kind of merited it. it he kind of deserved it because he had killed his own daughter. 
But that's weird, right? Because she's not a male family member. She's a female family member. And so on one hand, Clytemnestra says, oh, I'm off the hook. I ended the curse because now there's no other male family member to do it. And besides, I'm a female family member and the curse doesn't apply to us. But then Orestes thinks, well, Iphigenia died too. If she was killed as a result of this whole endless cycle of violence, then theoretically women are now on the menu, right? So on one hand, that means Clytemnestra is the next link in the chain. She not just should be killed because she killed my dad, but because she is under the auspices of the curse. The unfortunate conclusion of that is so am I, right? So is Orestes. And so if I keep it going, if I do what I know I must do in avenging my father, Am I equally guilty? Will I be killed for what I did as well? There aren't any other male family members that I'm aware of, so what's going to happen if that happens? And so as the plot thickens, as his quest to kill his mother gets closer and closer to its conclusion, he begins realizing in greater certainty, and people start telling him in greater certainty that he shouldn't think that he's off the hook. There is, you know, killing his mother will solve a problem, but it will cause a much bigger one. And so in the final scene, the climactic scene that leads to our catharsis, leads to the resolution of the plot, he is standing over his mother with a dagger, right? He has killed just this. He has killed Clytemnestra's lover and kind of usurper king, uh, and he's about to kill her too. And she basically lays it all out because she's a clever woman. She has thought all of this through and says, you can't kill me because I'm your mom, and that's a horribly immoral thing to do. Uh, but also there are consequences if you kill me. And he actually stops mid dagger stroke and thinks to himself out loud to the audience, out loud to his conspirators. I, I mean, I think I'm supposed to do this. This is what I think the gods want me to do. Should I go ahead? And the friends just say, do it. Let's see what happens. And so they go off stage. Clytemnestra is killed. The goat has been sacrificed, right? Uh, the end of the play leads to the next play, the final part of the tragedy, when it turns out he was right in that there's no other male family member to avenge him. In fact, the only other person theoretically who could avenge him is his sister, who was a co-conspirator, right? So she's not gonna kill him. So what happens? These furies, these supernatural beings rise out of the ground because even though this family curse had been keeping the cycle of violence going, now it can't keep on going, but the vengeance needs to be had. The, something needs to perpetuate the curse. And so these vengeful deities come after him instead. Hmm. So, I mean, to follow what you are, describing here to enter into these plays you've mentioned you know 15 names that yes. most people are not terribly familiar yes. with and even though what you describe here sounds like high drama and very interesting the clash of fate versus the the choice of revenge um how would you recommend that someone who is not as familiar for your high school students how do you lead them into these plays even though they're so they're so far off i mean we want to experience that catharsis and it sounds like you think it's possible yeah. Well, what's the on-ramp for people? I can approach this from two directions, I think. The first is, as a, as a reminder, that there are no spoilers in the Greek world, right? These stories are from the religion of the people writing them. It'd be the equivalent of a Christian author writing a tragedy about uh, King Herod, right? It's like, okay, we know the players of this story. We're not interested so much in the players because that's a given, right? The part that's not given is how the story is told, right? That's why we have movies about the passion narrative, right? About the New Testament. We know what happens, but we want it to be told to us in a particular way or in the way we're not used to because that's the part that's special. We use something we know as the basis for a narrative that we are not familiar with, that we're being introduced to. And it's the difference between the new version of the narrative and the old narrative that we are used to that is informational. So when it comes to this, the most important part of the story is not actually the names, right? Because again, the fact that it's alien to a American high school student and very well known to a Greek Athenian citizen is mostly irrelevant because that's not the point of the story. We don't care that Agamemnon died. We don't care that Clytemnestra uh, you know, sought vengeance or was uh, got her just desserts. We care that a king of men subverted his power for personal gain. We care that a wife was so incensed at the death of her daughter that she was willing to kill her own husband, right? The whole point of these stories is, again, that template, that 
kind of mode of storytelling underneath the names and the places and the things. Unfortunately, of course, and here's the second part, a lot of the nuance of this is lost if you don't know the names, right? So a high school student can come in and see, oh my gosh, this is an extraordinary story about a son trying to figure out whether my honor to my mother or my honor to my father is more important when I'm cho forced to choose, right? But if we know, for example, about the curse of the house of Atreus, then suddenly, oh, it's not just a mother versus father struggle or a son choosing a parent. There's an additional bit of information, right? So a very essential story becomes a much more kind of yeah. particular story. It's, it really speaks to why reading the Iliad or the Odyssey or some of these more fun, fundamental texts at a younger age is so helpful. I, I find it very satisfying having gotten to know Agamemnon a little bit in the Iliad and then hearing this story referenced in the Odyssey, then you come to this play and it starts to get fleshed out. You see different motives kind of amplified. And so that is kind of a satisfying thing that if you are immersed in this universe, it increases your level of engagement, it seems like to me. It does. And that's, I think, in extraordinarily deliberate. Uh, uh, any track of teaching, any educational order that says, get your Iliad done first, get your Odyssey done first, and then read these guys is, I mean, not only realistic, because that's how it would have been for a Greek person, right? It's the Iliad and the Odyssey, those are pure informational, right? Those are the broad templates of mythology that give you the information you need to know for this stuff to make sense. But also, just from the perspective of a middle school student reading the Iliad and the Odyssey and learning these names for the first time and getting the essential characteristics of what makes Odysseus Odysseus, he's clever, what makes Achilles important, he's strong but also stubborn, right? Then we get to read these versions of the story, which are not just a bunch of information, they're taking known information and recontextualizing them for a different purpose, right? So when I teach the tragedies, the assumption is, again, because my students coming into a tragedy class would have taken the Iliad and the Odyssey already, would be, all right, time to relearn, not unlearn, but relearn everything you thought you knew about Agamemnon, right? Thought he was just a total jerk in the Iliad. Turns out he's a much more complex figure. The rationales behind his decisions that you saw briefly in the Iliad are actually a lot more textured. Uh, and knowing that texture, knowing the human Agamemnon behind the name Agamemnon ends up turning the story into something much more compelling and much more human than something like the Odyssey. So we have just a couple more minutes. Um, if someone hearing you describe, you know, your love for the Greek tragedies wanted to engage, what would be your plan for them to read one play? What would they need to do beforehand to get familiar, to get ready? What would you recommend be the attitude they have when they open up the book? And what play would you choose for them to start with? Good question. So knowing what a Greek would know ahead of time, not in terms of the story, but in terms of the formula, I think is important. Again, as unromantic as that sounds, just knowing the shape of the story, that's how you determine whether one of these stories is excellent or not. Uh, you, If you know how a tragedy is supposed to go, right? If you know again, that there's this rising of crisis, this rising of tension up to this kind of utter climactic point where you can't imagine it getting any more tense. And then the sudden and immediate resolution for better or for worse, that's, you have to be ready for that and need to be looking for that rise as you go. Um, other things you need to look for are kind of hallmarks of what makes tragedy tragedy is that as Aristotle put it, tragedy is about great men falling, right? He didn't, he, he, his explanation of it, he was a huge fan of, of tragedies, uh, is that tragedies are only worth telling if the fall is from a very high place, right? And so the characters we learn about, Agamemnon, for example, king of men, right? The leader of the Greek army to Troy, a very important figure. Oedipus, one of the most celebrated kings of Thebes, very important figure. And it's from that lofty position, that honored position, and an honored position they earn because of some quality of theirs, that they end up falling on account of their fatal flaw. So find your protagonist, find their excellence, what makes them someone you don't want to fall, and then find out what is it about them that's going to make them fall. And you should be able to see throughout the story those little pokes and prods, those needle, little needle pricks of seeing maybe this guy's excellence isn't so excellent at all. So a recommendation of one play that someone should read to start? 
uh, I'll give you the option of choice. If you're looking for something very typical, uh, something very perfect in the sense of modeling the ideal tragedy, I would say Sophocles' Oedipus the King or Oedipus Rex. Uh, practically every ancient uh, commentator on tragedy points to this one as the best tragedy ever told. And few modern historians or modern literarians would disagree. I certainly wouldn't. It is an enormously excellent piece of literature. And I particularly like teaching it just because anyone who knows anything about the name Oedipus knows already what it's about, right? Which means you're already in the seat that the average Greek audience member is. We know it's a creepy story, but you're not there for the creepy part. Your part, that's all given, right? So when you go in, when you read that for the first time, you can put that on the side and say, okay, what's the story about a creepy dude who did a creepy thing actually about? Yeah. Well, John, uh, it's very interesting. You've at least ignited my curiosity in the Greek tragedians, Oedipus Rex. Um, so I appreciate that. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you very much, Shane. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Memoria Press podcast. If you like what you heard and you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever else you get your podcasts. My name is Shane Saxon, and I'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Memoria Press Podcast Network, providing a classical Christian perspective on the world of education.